body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer, Joel, here in the studio with me as well. And today we have an exceptionally dark episode for you. And I don't even understand why this one is so highly requested, but it is. And in today's episode, we are going to be going inside Satan's den, literally, which is the home and torture chamber of David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer. Now, I need to preface this episode with a warning because this one is going to be filled with lots of graphic details surrounding sexual assault, sexual violence. I mean, some of the most horrible things that could happen to you as a human being, especially as a female, are going to be in this episode. I'm going to try to dial it back some even because if I went all out, this would just be unbearable to listen to because of how disgusting and vile and evil David Parker Ray is. I mean, it's just, it's beyond comprehension when you hear what happens to the victims in this particular case. Now, before we get into today's episode, though, uh, I just want to say that if you are looking for something to help you chill out, help you relax, I know sometimes these episodes can be pretty intense or life can just be busy and, you know, maybe you struggle with some anxiety or just, you know, you need something to help chill you out. Well, look no further than Higher Love Wellness. We have premium CBD products that are made right here in Colorado, our home state. It is my CBD brand. Uh, everything is all natural. The vegan Joel's got that we we take usually before the show just help mellow us out a little bit. Yeah, I was gonna say he just reminded me to take my two gummies. Definitely got to take the two gummies, especially for this this episode. My yeah. God, you want some? Oh, I'll take a couple more. Right. Always take a couple more. Yeah, man, can't go wrong. And these gummies are grape, are watermelon, and blue raspberry. Mmm, delicious. delicious. Yeah. Each have 10 milligrams of CBD in it. Uh, no THC, so you don't have to worry about any of that. But if you're interested in checking out CBD or our products, it's higherlovewellness.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN, Care of, Raycon, and Quip. And I'm just going to say it right now. There's going to be a couple breaks in here for those ads. I understand it's not ideal, but honestly, I'm going to need a few breaks. I think we're going to need a uh -huh. few breaks during this one, and you probably will too, just because of how disturbing this episode is going to be. There's also some other sort of exciting news. We are actually going to be building a new studio for the show. If you enjoy the episodes on Apple Podcasts, we actually do video record the show as well, and we put it up on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, Lights Out Podcast, and so we're actually moving to a new studio and we're going to be putting a new set together um, and kind of changing it up a bit here in the next month or two, which is pretty exciting. You know, hopefully something that that makes a little bit more sense for this show, because as you guys know, or maybe you don't know, I actually host two shows. I have another show called Mile Higher Podcast, which I do with my wife, Kendall, and it's more of a true crime kind of unexplained mysteries type show. Um, and that records in the same space right here. So mm -hmm. if you watch multiple shows, you know that we switch up the signs back here. Every time. Every time. <laughs> yeah. So it gets pretty, pretty exhausting to sure. change the set and reset it up for every show. Um, so we're going to be having our own, very own studio soon that doesn't get changed, uh, which will be really cool. I'm very excited about that. For sure, man. And uh, yeah. And I just want to give Joel a shout out because, you know, if you've heard the intro song to the show... Joel's the one that created that, in case you didn't know. Yeah. Joel's super talented Thank musician. You, man. Yeah. Um, he's just great, all around a great producer. <laughs> and so <laughs> he created sure. our, our intro music for this show, but also Mile Higher. We actually just, just unveiled yeah. that in uh, this week's episode. So uh, if you haven't checked out Mile Higher Podcasts, definitely definitely check it out. It's it's definitely more, more of a, a true crime show. Uh, but we do cover a lot, uh, tons of alien stuff, tons of other unexplained mysteries on there, some, even some paranormal on there as well. So for sure, and well, I also did the song for the the Sesh podcast. That's right. As well, that's so, right. Yeah, all three shows. It feels good. Yeah, man. Good, <laughs> good work. And the Mile Higher family produce everything. You know. Yeah, it's all in house now, which yeah, is awesome. Yeah, that so, is awesome. Big, big thank you to Joel on that. Thank so, you. but yeah, let's. Uh, I guess God, I'm like dreading getting <laughs> into this. Day. I'm not gonna. Yes. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like this one is just. Ugh. it's so hard because like this stuff is just so sick mm -hmm. um and this is packed with details so so here we go so we're going to begin the story with cynthia v hill 
who was 22 years old and had fallen on some hard times. And she was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, just trying to make some money working as a sex worker. And on March 19th, 1999, she was introduced to an older man with a mustache. And this man met up with her in a parking lot. And the man was driving a Toyota RV. And when they met up, you know, this was a business transaction. They discussed payment and settled on an amount. Once they agreed on the amount, this man handed her the cash. And then she bent down to put the money into her shoe. And by the time she stood back up, this man had slapped a handcuff on her wrist. He then showed her a badge and said he was an undercover cop and that she was now under arrest for solicitation of sex. Cynthia obviously did not buy this and tried to get away from him. But then out of nowhere, a woman popped out and shocked her with a cattle prod. They then handcuffed her other hand and then dragged her into their RV. They then proceeded to take her clothes off and told her if she screamed, they'd use the cattle prod on her again. They then drove about 150 miles south of Albuquerque to Elephant Butte, New Mexico, and Cynthia was taken inside a dingy little house with a flat roof, and she was then thrown onto a bed in the living room, and they proceeded to chain her to the headboard and footboard with an iron collar around her neck. She was then left alone in the room, blindfolded and barely able to move. And just when she thought things couldn't get any worse, that's when she heard the click of a tape recorder. And then the man's voice started playing. And it was the same guy that had just abducted her. And what this tape plays is probably some of the most disturbing things you'll ever hear. It basically described to her what was about to happen to her in extremely graphic detail. And the recording started. Hello there, bitch. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained, gagged, probably blindfolded. You are disoriented and scared too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. For a little while at least, you need to get your shit together and listen to this tape. It is very relevant to your situation. The recording went on to say that she had been brought there to be a sex slave for this man and his friends, and that it was going to be, quote, painful as hell. She was then brought out of the house and put into a small trailer on his property. She was strapped down, raped, sodomized, shocked, and tortured for three days. And the entire time she knew this wasn't the man's first time or even his tenth time doing this. He was way too organized and meticulous. It was literally a living nightmare. On the third day, though, Cynthia made a miraculous escape and ran down Springland Boulevard screaming for help. And on that day, the police arrested Cindy Hendy and David Ray Parker, the man who had become known as the Toy Box Killer. Now, this tape, I said a few sentences of this tape. This tape is full front and back. And I'm not even going to go through and read the transcript. I'll, I will link it for you if you really want to read through what he says. But I'll just summarize. Basically, he says exactly what I mentioned before. That he's going to basically torture you for three days, sexually assault you in every way possible. In this torture chamber, which had a sign saying Satan's Den. And this guy had $100,000 worth of tools and mechanisms, machines that he used to torture his victims, which is why he was coined the Toy Box Killer. So David Parker Ray was born on November 6, 1939 in Bella, New Mexico, which is about a half hour away from Albuquerque. He was neglected and abused through most of his childhood, and by the time he was 10 years old, his mother and father had abandoned him and his sister Peggy. They then lived with their grandparents, and their grandfather was a strict disciplinarian and an abusive alcoholic who was especially violent towards David. Their dad was a truck driver who came around about once a month, and when he visited, he brought David a very unusual gift. Stacks of S&M porno magazines. Because of this, David was obsessed 
with the violent sexual images of BDSM. And he continued this obsession for the rest of his life. David was socially awkward and didn't know how to relate to his peers. He was painfully shy around girls and was bullied for it in high school. So he spent a lot of time alone just looking at his magazines and making drawings of sexual torture. His sister Peggy found his drawings at some point and she was shocked by how violent and graphic they really were. And when their grandmother died, Peggy was sent to live with another relative and David was left all alone with his abusive grandfather. And to cope, he started drinking and using drugs when he was just a young teenager. But as soon as he was old enough, he joined the military and was trained as a mechanic. And he served and received an honorable discharge. And he must have gotten over his shyness around women because he was married and divorced about four times and had two daughters. In 1993, he moved to a community in Hot Springs Landing right across from Elephant Butte Lake. The lake is a man-made reservoir surrounded by miles of abandoned land, caves, and ravines. Elephant Butte State Park is actually the largest state park in New Mexico. And David knew the area really well because he actually worked as an armed state park officer and mechanic for the parks department. I mean, how terrifying is that? Drifters and people who wanted to live off the grid set up tents, shacks, trailers, and mobile homes around the lake and surrounding areas. David actually lived in a double wide mobile home at 513 Bass Road. The property around the house was just filled with junk and there was a sign that said, beware of dog and another that said David P. Ray. Behind his house was an ordinary looking white trailer and it was about 25 feet long. There were no windows though, and if someone stepped close enough, they would see that there was no way inside. The door was locked tight with steel reinforced double bolt. David likely started committing serious crimes against women as early as the mid 1950s, but no one really knows for sure when he started or how many victims he had. He also invited other people to join in or be his accomplices, including women he was with and friends of his. And for decades, the group of them terrorized women in and around the area known as Truth or Consequences, also called TRC in central New Mexico, while he perfected this torture system. In the mid-90s, he met the woman who would become his ideal accomplice, Cindy Hendy. Cindy actually moved from Seattle to Truth or Consequences when she was 37 years old, and she met David in the state park while on a work release program and they had an instant connection. Cindy had fled Washington State in order to avoid prosecution for theft, forgery, and drug possession. And just like David, she had a very rough childhood. Her mom was an alcoholic and severely neglected her. Cindy often went days without food. She also witnessed her mom getting savagely beaten by her boyfriend. And when Cindy was eight, her mom married another man. And by the time she was 11, her stepdad had started molesting her. She tried to tell her mom about the molesting, but her stepdad convinced her mother it was a drunken mistake and he didn't know whose bed he was in. Cindy was kicked out of the house shortly after and was on her own at 12 years old. And in order to survive, she started dating drug dealers and doing sex work in order to just get by. She was also addicted to cocaine and like her mom, she drank a lot. And Cindy really liked very aggressive sex and encouraged her partners to get violent with her. She once told a boyfriend that they should rape somebody, maybe a prostitute. And by 15, she had dropped out of school completely, and she had her first child when she was 16. By her late 20s, she had three kids, and when her youngest was 10 years old, she sent them all to live with their grandparents. When David met Cindy, she was 20 years younger than him, but the age difference didn't matter to him. As soon as he found out that she liked rough sex, he introduced her to S&M and all his violent fantasies. So, Cindy said, sounds good, and moved in with him almost right away and became his partner in crime. David was also close with his 31-year-old daughter, Jessie Ray. He got help with kidnapping women from Jessie and her boyfriend, Dennis Roy Yancey. Dennis ran with the rough crowd. And one year, TRC had to cancel Halloween because him and his friends were driving all around the town, destroying property, flipping over historical gravestones, and even just strangling cats. David liked to surround himself with other reckless people, drug addicts, alcoholics, and petty criminals were more likely to be up for anything and less likely to remember everything that happened the night before. They also spent a lot of time at the Blue Water Saloon in TRC, about five miles away from Elephant Butte. It was the perfect place to hunt for their next victim. Before I continue, I want to quickly thank our first sponsors today. 
whenever I travel, you know, stay in hotels, go to coffee shops, or just use the internet at any public place, I'm always very concerned about who else is on the Wi-Fi with me. I actually have a background in IT, and I know for a fact that there's hackers out there who prey on people in these types of locations. And so there's, you know, there's always a chance that somebody could be watching the network traffic, capturing your passwords, credit card numbers, or whatever other information they want. So in order to keep myself safe in these locations, I always make sure I use a VPN. And not just any VPN, I specifically use and trust ExpressVPN. And on top of that, we all use incognito mode at some point, don't we? And let me tell you something, incognito mode does not hide your activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Your internet service provider can still see every single website that you've ever visited. So that's another reason why, even while I'm at home, I never go online without using an ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash lights out, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash lights out. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash lights out to learn more. I don't know about you, but I feel like I can always up my dental hygiene game. And with Quip, I'm able to do that super easily. Thanks to Quip, my dental hygiene game has never been better because they've got you covered with all of the best dental products you could possibly need. They have the best toothbrushes. I've been using a Quip toothbrush for probably three years now, and I've had great reports from the dentist every time I've gone for my annual cleanings. And what's great about their toothbrushes is that their brush heads are replaceable. They ship them to you on a dentist recommended schedule. They're sleek. They've got a cover, super easy to travel with, and there's no charger, which is really, really cool. But they also have a flosser that has refillables on it. But now what's really cool is they have their own chewing gum. Because if you didn't know, chewing gum is actually a great way to give you better oral health. The American Dental Association actually recommends chewing sugar-free gum for 20 minutes after meals. It makes sense. It helps you collect all those food particles. And in addition to gum packs, Quip also delivers, you know, those fresh brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills every three months for just five bucks. And shipping is free, so you can save a ton of money and skip the misery of the in-store shopping. So if you want to check out Quip today, you can go to getquip.com slash lights out right now, and you'll get a free plastic dispenser with any refill plan. That's a free dispenser at getquip.com slash lights out. Again, that's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash lights out. You can also find the Quip electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and more in the oral care aisle at your local Walmart. Quip is the good habits company, and boy, do I love them. All right. From here on out, things are only going to get darker and more disturbing. So David and his accomplices kidnapped young women to use as sex slaves. And what made his crimes different from other sadistic rapists was his toy box, the locked windowless trailer behind his home. Inside this ordinary looking trailer was truly a living nightmare. David had spent over $100,000 renovating it into exactly what he wanted, his personal torture chamber and the perfect way to act out his sickest fantasies. It's literally this guy's life's work. He had built the secret torture chamber to be inescapable, and no matter what happened inside, no one would ever know, as it was completely soundproof. Another unique aspect of his crimes was his introduction tape. David had tape recorded himself describing everything his victims were about to experience, and he played it for them as an introduction to the next several weeks or months of their lives. An excerpt from the tape says we live in an isolated area, so screaming is usually not a problem. In the playroom, it's not much of a problem at all because of the soundproofing, but it irritates the fuck out of me. There is a time and a place. Occasionally, I like to hear a bitch scream, but usually not. The only thing that screaming is going to get you around here is a lot of punishment. The images from inside his trailer are probably some of the most horrifying images you could possibly imagine. And they include straps, steel chains, ball gags, iron collars hung from the walls. And his torture devices included pulleys, clamps, saws, surgical blades, syringes, and a variety of modified sex toys like dildos covered in spikes. Over the wood-paneled walls, he hung diagrams that he had drawn himself. And they were detailed drawings of the female anatomy and the most effective ways to cause the most suffering. There was a map of pain, even, created through years of experience torturing women. There was a sign on the wall that summed up his life philosophy. 
If they're worth taking, they're worth keeping. And another sign named the toy box Satan's Den. He had a homemade coffin to lock up his victims. Or he might just lock up their head in a head-sized wooden box. He used his training as a mechanic to construct his own homemade torture devices. He made an electric generator to power things like his motorized dildo and breast shocker. He had homemade leg spreader bars and a wooden stand where he placed victims to rape them. And while bent over the stand, they were completely immobilized. But his favorite thing in his toy box was a gynecological chair in the middle of the room, and it was completely customized for his sick games. When strapped in, the victim was facing the ceiling where he had mounted a large mirror, and he wanted her to be forced to watch everything he was doing to her. I mean, it doesn't get much more evil than that. Not only are you torturing somebody, but you're forcing them to watch you torture them. Can't even imagine. He usually had a video camera in front of the chair also to record the torture sessions. Other times he kept his victim blindfolded so she couldn't see what was going to happen next. He would strap a victim into the chair and place electrodes on her body. These were used as punishment if she said or did anything he didn't like or whenever he wanted to cause pain because he enjoyed inflicting pain more than anything. He said, I cannot get off with a girl unless I hurt her first. That's basically the reason I'm into rape and slavery and the reason that you're going to be subjected to a certain amount of pain. Mostly what we do to a captive is stick needles in her breasts and through her nipples, as well as through other body parts that stretch. David was clearly a sexual sadist, which is a person who can only get off when another person is being physically or mentally tortured. Sexual sadists don't care about their victims at all, clearly. It's like they're not even human beings. All David cared about was his own pleasure. I mean, he literally told them in the tapes that you're basically no different than an animal, than a dog, and that I'm going to use you accordingly while you're here. And I'm going to treat you like an animal, keep you fed, give you water, but basically you're going to be completely obedient to me. What's also very clear is that David is a complete psychopath with no compassion or empathy whatsoever. During the course of the day, he said you're going to be raped several times, but that's no big deal. The second day after you get totally familiar with the rules and procedures, we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. A lot of it will not be very pleasant for you, but you might as well get used to it because it's going to be like that for a while. And he had the whole thing very well organized. From the time he chose his next victim, he has his entire time with them planned out. And after a while, he had done this so many times to different women, he could predict what his victim was thinking. The last known version of the tape he would make was on July 23rd, 1993. His victims were told up front that they had been kidnapped to be used as a sex slave and that there was no point fighting it because it didn't matter how much they begged, cried, screamed, or threatened. They just had to accept that this was their new reality. But sometimes he wanted them to scream, but it had to be on his own terms. Some victims tried to bribe him with money or pretend like they liked what was happening to convince him to take off the chains, but none of that ever worked. David already had exactly what he wanted. And he preferred his victims young in their early to mid-teens. They were easier to manipulate and had his preferred body type. Sexually mature, but still small. He's quoted as saying, It goes without saying that you're a fine body and you're probably young. Maybe very young, because for our purposes, we prefer to snatch girls in the early to mid-teens. Sexually developed, but still small-bodied. Scared shitless, easy to handle, and easy to train. David also enjoyed raping gay women. So sometimes he went to a local gay bar to find his next victim. And when he had a fresh victim, he made her go through a kind of intake process. He strapped her to a gynecological chair naked and attached electrical clamps to her nipples. Then he went through a lengthy questionnaire asking detailed questions about her medical and sexual history. If she refused to answer or gave an answer he didn't like, she would be shocked. He told his victims to be prepared to be raped and tortured for at least a month and maybe for two or three months. In the tape that he'd play for his new victims, it would say, You've been taken by force, and you're going to be kept and used by force. What all this amounts to is that you're going to be kept naked and chained up like an animal, to be used and abused any time we want to, any way that we want to. And you might as well start getting used to it, because you're not going to be kept here and used to it until such a time as we get tired of fucking around with you. And we will eventually in a month or two, maybe three. It's no big deal. He also told them up front that he didn't plan to kill them. He preferred to keep his victims alive. 
He kidnapped at least four or five girls or young women per year, and he didn't want to worry about hiding that many bodies. David said that if I killed every bitch that we kidnapped, there'd be bodies strung all over the country. And besides, I don't like killing a girl unless it's absolutely necessary. So I've devised a safe alternative method of disposal. After we get completely through with you, you're going to be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentanol and phenobarbital. And these are both hypnotic drugs that will make you extremely susceptible to hypnosis, auto-hypnosis, and hypnotic suggestion. You're going to be kept drugged a couple of days while I play with your mind. And by the time I get through brainwashing you, you're not going to remember a fucking thing about this little adventure. But he also warned them that he had no problem killing them if it came down to that. He said, I'm sure that you want to survive this experience and I want you to also. But you are expendable and it's no big deal to go out and snatch a replacement. It may sound harsh and cold, but if you give us too much trouble or you pose any kind of threat to us, I won't have any qualms at all about slicing your throat. So imagine how absolutely terrifying this was for victims. I mean, not only are they brought into his toy box, but he's literally telling them these things. The psychological torture that he does on top of the physical torture. I mean, literally brainwashing you with these drugs, putting you into hypnosis. I mean, it doesn't get any scarier than this. And then if you're like, well, fuck that. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to kill this guy. I'm going to try to escape. He's literally like, try that. And I'm just going to, I'm going to take you out. And he seems smart enough to pick up on what they're thinking. And he could be thinking that if, oh, he's 10 steps ahead of you. Clearly. Right. I mean, he's done this so long and with so many people that he, there is no escaping this guy. Uh -huh. You are forced to just do what he wants you to do. If you want to survive. Right. Right. At the end of the day, I think you, your mind just goes to, I want to survive this. But honestly, if this were me in this situation, I'd be like, just fucking kill me. Like, Oh yeah. I wouldn't even want to go through this. I mean, fuck, this is just, this is beyond, I mean, I'm trying to, th I can't even think of this from a female perspective, but if it was switched, you know, the genders were switched, I would be like, just kill me right now. Like, fuck this. I don't want to go through this. No. I don't care what, what you're going to do. I don't care if I make it out of life. Like, I don't even imagine how, how damaged you'd be after this, even right. if you didn't remember what happened. Yeah. And in his mind, he thinks, oh, well, I'll just use you and then I'll just, Basically, I have the power to erase your mind and you'll be able to go out there and just like survive and mm. recover. And, you know, I don't do anything that's too horrible to you that you can't actually recover from. And but it's like. I highly doubt that that's the case. I mean, let's be real. He probably can't no. erase your mind. No way. You're going to have you're going to recall some of this at some point. Yeah. And regardless, your body's going to be fucked up. You're going to have scars from this. You're going to mm -hmm. have some type of evidence that something happened to you and you're going to recall this I for mean, sure there's no way that with these two drugs that it's just like gone uh, forever and it's like it never happened. and i could like, only imagine the, the amount of nightmares afterwards like the PT, yeah. ptsd and yeah you know, just because your conscious mind doesn't remember doesn't mean your subconscious right mind doesn't right and yeah that's a great point I, mm -hmm. i'm sure plenty of his victims had memories after this but his girlfriend cindy was also very involved in the rape and torture sessions. And he told his victims that he would have help from his quote, lady friend. He said, my lady friend and I have been keeping sex slaves for years. We both have kinky hangups, including rape, dungeon games, etc. We found that it is extremely convenient to keep one or two female captives available constantly to us satisfy our particular needs. We are very selective when we snatch a girl to use for these purposes. And when he's referring to these dungeon games, He's talking about forcing victims to perform oral sex on both of them. And he had a very stern warning about biting. If during oral sex or any other time you should bite one of us, I'm going to cut on you a little bit. I'll cut your nipple off for a starter. And if it's a bad bite, I'll cut your tit off too. That may sound harsh, but your teeth are serious weapons and we're not going to tolerate any shit from you. I've been bitten and I've cut off nipples. So don't fuck around. He also warned them against being rebellious in general. Once in a while, we get a bitch that is resentful, rebellious, won't mind, uncooperative. That doesn't work here. I'm sure that you realize you're on thin ice. As long as you have chains on your body, don't try either one of us. It is an extremely dangerous thing to do because if necessary, I'm capable of doing things to your body and torturing you in ways that you can't even imagine. The playroom is equipped with a full set of surgical instruments which I have had on occasion to use and I am more than happy to use again as necessary. Sometimes 
He had two victims at once, but he was clear that it wouldn't make a difference. If there's another girl in the room, she won't be able to help you either because she's going to be in the same position you're in. In fact, David was so confident that the toy box was inescapable. So if you try escaping, I'm sure you'll try to figure out a way. That's human nature. But it's not hardly even worth talking about here. It could not be prudent on her part to have you running around in the woods screaming rape. It would be an embarrassment to say the least. Consequently, you're going to be kept in an environment that is even more secure than a prison cell. The hidden playroom where you're going to be kept, and again, this is all in the tape that he plays for his new victims, has steel walls, floor, and ceiling. It is virtually soundproof and has a steel door with two keyed locks. The hinges are welded on and there are two heavy deadbolts on the outside. The room is totally escape proof. Even with tools, we're not real concerned about you escaping. You're fucking sure not going to go anywhere. In addition to all of this, David threw sex parties and invited his friends over to rape his victims, which meant that a lot of people knew exactly what was going on in there and never did anything about it, which is probably the sad, one of the saddest things about this, that people partaked in this toy box and never came forward. David described these sex parties in the introduction tape, and it's probably one of the most horrifying parts. What happened to the victims during these parties was unimaginable and truly disgusting. He put on a kind of show for his friends. He brought the victim into his house and set her up on the wooden stand where she was bent over on the stand on all fours with her legs, ankles, wrists, and hips strapped to metal frames. He would then use the leg spreader bars to widen her knees about 12 inches apart where her genitals were exposed and her breasts were positioned between a metal support bar. And he said she was positioned like a dog in heat. He rubbed a canine breeder product all over her body and genitals, and then he brought in his three male dogs, including a large German shepherd. And you can imagine what would happen next. Sometimes David did this with just him and his dogs even, and he warned his victims that this would happen to them at least a few times while he had them. Basically, absolutely nothing was too sick and depraved for David's twisted mind. David had devised what he believed to be a foolproof system for getting away with his crimes without needing to kill his victims. He actually borrowed techniques from the MK Ultra mind control program. He also gave his victims a mix of drugs that made them easy to manipulate, highly suggestible, and most importantly, unlikely to remember what had happened to them. Used in the right quantities, the drugs could knock a victim out for about 5-10 to 10 minutes, or even for a few hours. They also had a hypnotic effect that puts a person in a mental state between waking and sleep, which makes them docile and less likely to fight back. One of the drugs, phenobarbital, slows the activity of the brain and central nervous system, making it easier to restrain and control victims while keeping them awake. He kept his victims drugged most of the time and gave them very little food or water because he wanted them to be as weak and disoriented as possible. And before he let his victims go, he got them heavily drugged up and then played mind games with them, which is basically brainwashing them. He made sure they were confused about what really happened, and that they questioned their own reality. And by the time they were free, the whole thing just felt like this surreal nightmare. They had vague flashes of what had happened, but couldn't remember how they got there or put the events in any sort of logical order. Law enforcement officers are trained to interrogate victims like suspects, and victims of trauma often remember the experience in fragmented, disordered pieces, even if they weren't drugged. So David made sure that his victims were the least reliable witnesses, so no one would believe a word they said. And for decades, years and years and years, this method worked. Before he dumped his victims, he thoroughly washed them, making sure there was no DNA left behind, and then he would just leave them like a pile of of trash on the side of the road. But more than once, him and his accomplices did end up killing a victim. And when this happened, He had the perfect plan to hide the remains. First, he would dismember the body and then scatter the parts throughout the remote wilderness around Elephant Butte Lake. A lot of this area around Elephant Butte Lake is unexplored terrain, but David made sure to spend a lot of time getting to know the most isolated areas that were nearly impossible to find. David ended the introduction tape that I've been reading from with final words of advice for his new sex slave on how to make it through this whole ordeal alive. He said, be smart and be a survivor. Don't ever scream. Don't talk without permission. Be very quiet. 
be docile and obedient, and by all means show proper respect. David was an opportunist and often snatched women off the street spontaneously, like if he saw a jogger or just someone stranded on the side of the road with a broken car. But other times, his victims were someone he already knew. One of his victims was Kelly Garrett, and Kelly Garrett was actually friends with David's daughter, Jessie. On July 24th, 1996, she got into a big fight with her husband and decided to go out with her friends to cool off. She met up with Jesse at the Blue Water Saloon in TRC to drink and play some pool. Jesse had already been recruited by David to help him kidnap new sex slaves, and Kelly was an easy target. She drugged her beer when she wasn't looking, and when Kelly started feeling woozy, Jesse offered her a ride home. She told her friend that they just needed to stop by her dad's house real quick. And when they got there, Kelly got out of the car and almost immediately blacked out. David had actually hit her on the head with something, and she fell to the ground unconscious. And when she woke up, she was in the toy box strapped to a table with a dog collar and leash around her neck. And that's when the introduction tape started playing. She heard a man's voice telling her to call him master and his female accomplice mistress. And then it went on to say, now let's start this off right. You are a slave. You don't realize it yet, but you will eventually. I'm your master and the lady is your mistress. You will be totally docile. You'll be very quiet and you'll speak only when spoken to. Never initiate conversation and keep your mouth shut. And for two days, she was drugged, raped, and tortured. There are conflicting stories about what happened when David was done with her. In one version, David slit her throat and dumped her on the side of the road in Caballo, New Mexico, assuming she was dead. In another version, he took her back to her house wearing his park ranger uniform and told her husband he found her wandering around Elephant Butte Lake. Either way, Kelly was treated at a local clinic, but couldn't remember what happened to her, enough to put the pieces together. Her husband accused her of cheating on him and actually ended up filing for divorce later that year. So just a horrible, horrible, fucking traumatic experience to go through. And we don't even know for sure if she was left for dead or she was brought home, like David says. Now, before we get into some of the other victims of David's and the investigation and ultimately the trial, I want to take one more break. We'll be right back. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things that I own are my Raycon wireless earbuds because I use them all the time, whether I'm at the gym or just laying in bed at night, trying to take my mind off these horrible episodes that I cover on Lights Out. My Raycon wireless earbuds are always there to provide me with that beautiful, soothing music to help drift me off into dreamland. Raycons are a game changer because they are premium wireless earbuds that provide you with tons of bass, clear, crystal clear sound, and they're discreet. They fit right in your ears. They got different size pads, and best of all, they have a charging case that they go into, so they're always ready for you to use. But the best part is that Raycon makes great sound accessible to everyone with wireless earbuds starting at half the price of other premium audio brands. And right now, Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners, and here's what you gotta do to go and get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash lights out, and that's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order, so feel free to grab a pair and a spare. And if you don't like the earbuds, they also have over-ear headphones as well. Again, that's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash lights out. Buyraycon.com slash lights out. And our last sponsor for today is Care Of. Care Of is the personalized supplements, vitamin provider that has truly changed my life. I've had incredible results thanks to Care Of. Before I found Care Of, I never knew what vitamins I needed to take. I never knew what supplements I needed to meet my specific wellness goals. But what's great about Care Of is they have a holistic online quiz, which is like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist all without leaving your house. And this quiz just asks you about your lifestyle, what goals you might have for your wellness, and just things about your body, you know, just how does your digestive system work in, different things like that. And based on how you answer those questions, it kicks out a list of different supplements and vitamins that Care Of expertly thinks would help you in your life. What I like best about Care Of though is that they send it all to you in these boxes that just sits on my dresser and every night I pull a pack from it, pop my vitamins in before I go to sleep. It's that easy. It's got my name on it and it's got everything I need. I don't have to buy like 
18 different bottles in order to get all the vitamins and supplements that I need, which is super nice. I mean, I just love the convenience of it. You can stop and start your subscription whenever you can change it. You can add, remove things as you want. Care of is truly the one-stop solution for all your vitamin supplement needs to help you reach your wellness goals. And right now you can get 50% off your first care of order. All you got to do is take care of.com and enter code lights out 50. Again, definitely check out care of guys. It's really cool stuff. And you can get 50% off your first care of order. Go to take care of.com and make sure you enter code lights out 50. Oh man. I got to say before I continue, this is probably one of the toughest episodes I've had to record. I'm just going to be straight with you oh, because yeah. Easily. this kind of shit is probably some of the most disturbing things I've ever even had to think about. Yeah. Same here. And I, I really don't understand why people are interested in hearing about people that do this kind of shit. Torture, I think yeah. is probably just the most horrifying thing. I think I a can, human being could experience. Yeah. Or an animal or an animal. I mean, it doesn't matter. Any what? living thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fucked up. Cause like just growing up, like I always try to stay away from, the films that had torture in them yeah me too because those were the ones that were the nightmare causing ones yeah i feel like i mean the only torture films you and i really watched was like the saw series that's but, true but that's a bit different because i mean they do incorporate like a backstory and like yeah and it's like, like that. the way they yeah the way they present it is more of like this sick game which mm. i guess doesn't really change the fact that it's torture it's still torture but but it's not like you know, the fact that I think what keeps you watching those movies is the fact that there is this chance of getting out. Yeah. Like there is like you can escape mm -hmm. the saw traps. Yeah. Like everybody could escape those traps if you do things correctly. Correct. Yeah. And I think that's what makes that watchable mm -hmm. is it's like the suspense of is this person going to figure out how to get out of this trap or not versus like in David's situation. This is just horrific because there is no escape. Mm -hmm. And you are in this sick toy box of his right. where there is no escape. You doesn't matter if you scream. And if you do, it shit only gets worse for you. Right. So there it's, it's literal hell on earth mm -hmm. is and, what he's created and incorporating the sexual assault. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then that too. Yeah. Yeah. Because and, I was going to say like the only film I've seen that's come to mind. I didn't see the whole thing was hostile. Yeah. You know, cause that movie made me sick. I can't sit through that. Or like yeah. human centipede yeah. to some extent is kind of like, like this kind of, and that shit fucked me up. Like, uh -huh. I did not enjoy that. No. At all. I was like, after I watched that, I just was like, I shouldn't have watched that. Yeah, I'm just I, I regret that even watching a bit of Hostel. And it's Hostel just too. disturbing. It's, just, it's like, it's like, why? I don't get how anyone can see watch the whole movie. You and know? who's like, I'm a fan of that. I know. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Dude? Seriously, you have some like, issues if that's a case. Like, if you're like, oh, that was a great movie. I really enjoyed it from from start to finish. Like, I I don't know. I, yeah. I just don't get it. I think clearly there's people out there that you know, are sadistic that uh -huh. find this shit fucking enjoyable and entertaining. And right. I will never understand that. That's for sure. For sure. Well, at least you only need to read this through <laughs> once. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I got to edit this later. So <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, listen you got to this round two, coming. round two coming. God, so dude, I'm trying to like tune out some of these details. Go ahead. It's, it's too much. Go ahead. I don't blame <laughs> you, man. And yeah. I don't blame anybody else who's tuned out at this point either. Uh, Cause ah, oh, this shit's just so fucked up. Yeah. So another one of David, Parker Ray's victims was Angelica Montano and she went by Angie. She was a single mom and had moved to the area from Albuquerque to get a fresh start after a messy divorce. And she had actually met David's girlfriend, Cindy, and they became friends in late February, 1999. Cindy invited Angie over to hang out. And when she got there, she was drugged and knocked unconscious and the whole cycle started all over again. For four or five days, she was raped and tortured continuously by the couple, and she begged them to let her go back home to her young son. David became frustrated by all her begging and said, If I knew you were so much, I wouldn't have kidnapped you. And when they were done with Angie, David drove a few hours up Interstate 25 and dropped her off, only after doing his usual drugging routine, which didn't work, as Angie remembered every detail of what they did to her. She was actually picked up by an off-duty cop and started telling him everything. She was obviously super frantic, and her story just sounded so insane that the cop didn't even believe her. But he still offered to take her to the police station to report it, but she refused, as she didn't think any of the other cops would believe her either. Plus, she was just too scared to report it officially, as David had warned her not to tell anyone what happened, 
or he'd come back for her. The officer then dropped her off near her house, not even at her door. And within 48 hours, she had packed up all her belongings and moved back to Albuquerque with her son. Let's kind of circle back to the beginning of this episode where we talked about Cynthia V. Hill. Because that's where things start to fall apart for David Parker Ray. So within a month of this whole ordeal with Angie, David and Cindy abducted Cynthia V. Hill from the parking lot in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they had no idea that she would be their last victim. In March of 1999, Cindy Hendy wanted to go visit her daughter in Oregon because she was having a baby. But David told her she wasn't allowed to go until she got him a new sex slave. So she found Cynthia through a pimp and the couple drove to Albuquerque to meet her on March 19th. They then kidnapped her and brought her back to Elephant Butte where she was raped and tortured for three days. They barely gave her any food and she was drugged continuously. And they actually hung her from the ceiling and shocked her body until she passed out. David told her she was never going to see her family ever again, and he said he planned to kill her, and she believed him. On the third day, David was going back to work. He had a whole security checklist that he usually followed before leaving his victims. But Cynthia was very weak, so he thought it would be safe to just take off her handcuffs and shackles. She still had an iron collar around her neck that was chained to the wall. He then left his daughter Jessie in charge of watching her, and around 3.15 that afternoon, the phone rang and Jesse stepped away to answer it. But Jesse left the keys to the shackles on a nearby table, and Cynthia knew this was her only chance. So as soon as Jesse closed the door behind her, Cynthia slid her body down and stretched out as much as she could to get to the keys. She was able to grab them off the table, but before she could completely get herself free, Jesse came back and started fighting with her. Jesse smashed a lamp over Cynthia's head and stabbed her in the back with an ice pick. And during the struggle, Cynthia managed to pick up the phone and dial 911, but Jesse pulled her away. The dispatcher on the other line heard the struggle, but no one was there, and then the line went dead. The dispatcher called back, as they should, but this time Jesse answered and said, Oh, everything's fine. We just called by mistake, and she hung up again. But while Jesse was distracted, Cynthia got free from the wall and picked up the ice pick, and when Jesse turned back around, Cynthia stabbed her in the neck and ran. So happy for Cynthia. But she was in the middle of nowhere, naked and covered in blood with an iron collar and chains around her neck. She ran down the road, frantically trying to wave down cars. She kept moving because she didn't know if Jesse was chasing after her. At one point, she was literally running in circles, completely disoriented and not really knowing if she could trust anyone who tried to help her. And there were actually multiple calls in 911 reporting a naked woman, bloody, running down the street. Eventually, though, Cynthia was able to get to another trailer and started pounding on the door. An old woman lived there, and when she opened the door, Cynthia ran inside and hid under a table. She was absolutely shaking and terrified. The old woman gave her a robe and comforted her, but once Cynthia had calmed down, the woman called for an ambulance. Cynthia was then taken to Sierra Vista Hospital where they had to use bolt cutters to get the iron collar off her neck, and obviously, the medical staff contacted the police. Meanwhile, David and Cindy were out looking for Cynthia. After Jesse hung up the 911 call, the dispatcher had a very bad feeling. The woman had seemed irritated and the signs of a struggle were pretty clear. So she sent officers to the address for a welfare check. But by the time they got there, no one was home. The curtains were closed, but when they peeked through, they could see a bed in the corner of a living room covered in blood. Other officers in the area responded to the 911 calls about the naked woman. And that's when they saw David and Cindy driving slowly along, almost like they were looking for something. And Cindy was bleeding from the head and neck. Police stopped the couple and started asking questions about the woman. And they admitted right away to kidnapping Cynthia. But they said they had done it for her own good. And that they were just trying to help her get over a heroin addiction. But obviously the officers were like, yeah, that doesn't make any fucking sense. So we're going to arrest you guys. And that's exactly what happened. David and Cindy were arrested and charged with kidnapping and aggravated battery. But that's when the police got a warrant to search the house and trailer. But when the police got there, the trailers locked up tight. They couldn't get into it and ended up calling a locksmith to break through the steel reinforced double deadbolt. And what they found inside was shocking and horrifying. And as soon as they entered, they saw the white sign in bold red lettering that said Satan's Den. Inside were countless torture devices, clamps, whips, pliers, sex toys, clips, chains, hooks, harnesses, muzzles, and handcuffs 
violent pornography and graphic drawings hung on the walls. There is a collection of anatomically correct dolls wrapped in chains and placed in bondage positions. The gynecological chair was in the middle of the room with a mirror above it and a camera propped up in front of it. Chains and hooks hung from the ceiling and a makeshift coffin was against the wall. They knew right away that they were dealing with an absolute and true psychopath. And as the details started to come out to the media, the public was just as shocked and horrified, and it quickly made headlines nationwide. And then another victim came forward. Angie Matano had never reported what had happened to her because she didn't think the police would believe her. And she, again, had moved back to Albuquerque and tried to move on with her life. She had only ever told two other people besides the off-duty cop who picked her up on the side of the road, and one of those friends convinced her that it was safe to come forward, as David Parker Ray was now behind bars and couldn't hurt her anymore. Detectives now had two first-hand accounts from two survivors, Cynthia and Angie, and they used this to pressure Cindy Hendy into talking. She told the detectives about the photos and videos that David kept from previous victims, and she gave them the names of two other accomplices, Jesse Ray and Dennis Royancy. Police then brought Jesse and Dennis in for questioning, and they both quickly turned on each other and David. Jesse told them that she helped David and Dennis kidnap Dennis's ex-girlfriend, Marie Parker, in 1997. And after they raped and tortured her, Dennis had strangled Marie to death while David recorded it. Dennis admitted that he had killed her but claimed David had held a gun to his head and forced him to do it. He then helped David dispose of her body in the desert. And when he tried to lead them to the spot, there was nothing there. Detectives believed David had gone back and moved her body so that no one but him knew where she was. During his interrogation, David told them about another accomplice, a former business partner named Billy Bowers. But he said, you know, don't go and try to find Billy because he murdered him too. And when police searched his trailer, they found a videotape from 1996 of the rape and torture of a young woman. David and Cindy were both clearly visible in this tape. The woman had a unique tattoo on her ankle and they released a still from the video hoping someone would recognize it. And someone did. Kelly Garrett's former mother-in-law knew right away that it was Kelly's ankle in the image. After her husband accused her of cheating and divorced her, she moved to Colorado. She was still plagued by vivid, terrifying nightmares, and she could no longer separate dreams from reality. And when detectives contacted her, they showed her the image and asked her if it was her tattoo. Kelly said it was, but by now, she was convinced that her nightmares weren't real. But then, police showed her another still from the rape video. And then the flashes in her mind started coming together, and the memories came flooding back. The more they questioned her, the more she remembered what happened to her inside David's toy box. There were pictures of more women in the trailer, along with David's diary where he kept track of his victims. David marked down the dates of when he kidnapped a new victim and how many times he tortured them. But there were no names, and he didn't say he did it to them and when he was done. They also found dozens of items that belonged to the victims that he had kept as trophies. He had shelves of clothes, jewelry, and other possessions as mementos of his horrific crimes. David even bragged to his detectives that he had killed at least 40 women. The FBI sent 100 agents to search his property in the surrounding area, and Cindy and Jesse led them to multiple spots where David had told them he left bodies. They also searched Elephant Butte Lake multiple times which this lake is 23 miles long, about 4 miles wide and 100 feet deep in some parts, but they never found any human remains there. Investigators have little hope that they will ever be found. They believe David used his knowledge of the area to hide his victims' bodies in places so remote and isolated that they'll probably never be found. No physical evidence has ever been uncovered that proved David murdered any of his victims himself, though. Cindy, Jesse, and Dennis all took plea bargains in exchange for information about each other and David. Cindy, however, was facing up to 197 years in prison if she was convicted on all 25 felony counts of kidnapping and criminal sexual penetration. So she turned on David for a much shorter sentence and agreed to testify against him. She claimed she knew at least 14 girls and young women that he had murdered, and David told her he killed at least once a year for the last 40 years. She also told the police how he claimed he hid the bodies in the lake. He said weighing the body down wasn't enough, so to keep it from ever resurfacing, you have to cut them down the belly, scoop out their guts, fill the chest cavity with cement weights, and then use bailing wire to wrap them up. When David first started telling her about these things, she said she was a little nervous, but also intrigued. And the two of them seemed to feed off each other and brought out the very worst and sickest traits of the other. 
She said when she was watching David torture one of their sex slaves, or when she was doing it herself, she didn't feel any remorse. She wasn't horrified because nothing drastic ever happened to the victims. But she ultimately blamed everything on David and said she's angry at him for putting her in this situation. Cindy ended up taking a plea deal on April 6, 1999, and she was sentenced to 36 years in prison. Dennis Yancey stuck to a story that he had to kill Marie Parker or David would have killed him. He said he had no choice. He was convicted of second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and given two consecutive 15-year sentences. But David's trials turned out to be much more complicated. At some point, Cindy and Dennis both changed their minds about testifying against him, which slowed things down. Dennis had received a threatening note that said, rats die in jail. And while Cindy got love letters from David that said he still loved her and wanted to marry her, David's failing health caused more complications. The first trial was supposed to be in March 2000, but it was postponed after he had a heart attack. It was postponed a second time so he could be tried for a 1996 murder in Colorado. There wasn't much evidence in the case, and he was actually acquitted and sent back to New Mexico. Cynthia, Kelly, and Angie were all scheduled to testify against him, actually. But during the trial in Colorado, Angie had died of heart failure, brought on by pneumonia at the age of 28. The next trial started that May, but it ended in a mistrial because the jurors couldn't agree if his victim was really kept against her will, which absolutely blows my mind. One problem was that his victims often had high-risk lifestyles like sex workers, homeless people, and drug addicts, which juries didn't have much sympathy for. David purposely chose victims that were viewed with less sympathy by the public and the police to help him get away with the crimes, and now is helping him to convince a jury. Plus, they weren't considered reliable witnesses because of the drugs he gave them. They couldn't remember everything that happened, and they didn't have a clear timeline. And what's crazy is that a few days into the next trial, the judge died, and it was postponed until April 2001. But finally, he was found guilty on 12 charges for kidnapping, rape, and torture of Cynthia V. Hill. But he still had to be tried for the other crimes before being sentenced, and that trial began in June 2001. The FBI's top expert in criminal sexual sadism, Mary Ellen O'Toole, testified for the prosecution. She had personally examined the toy box and homemade torture devices and talked about how much time, energy, and money he had put into it. She explained that there is no treatment or therapy for criminal sexual sadism like this, and the only way to stop him was to lock him away forever. How about just put him in the electric chair? My God. And during Cynthia's testimony at this trial, David's attorney taunted her with a dog collar and chain she was wearing when she escaped. And when he slammed them down in front of her, Cynthia lost it. She started screaming at David that he had ruined her life, and she was so hysterical that they had to call an ambulance for her in order for her to calm down. David apparently had enough of sitting through trials at this point and agreed to just take a plea deal. He pled guilty to all charges in exchange for a much lighter sentence for his daughter Jessie. And before his sentencing, the victims and family members made statements to the court. Kelly Garrett, now Kelly Van Cleve, said she is not a victim but a survivor, and she didn't want him to receive the death penalty. Instead, she wanted him to suffer in prison. Angie's mother, Loretta Romero, spoke for her daughter and Angie's two young sons. She said after her attack, Angie was never the same and that David destroyed all of their lives. But she still forgave him because that's what Angie would do. Cynthia Vigil was not as forgiving, though. She talked about the long-term effects of what he did to her. She said she's constantly afraid and always carries a gun and never goes out alone. She told David she wanted him to suffer like he made her suffer. Cynthia's grandmother, Bertha V. Hill, also made a statement. She told David to his face that he was a poor excuse for a human being and that she prays that he will suffer every day for the rest of his life and then burn in hell forever. And through all this, David showed no emotion or remorse. And when it was his turn to talk, he seemed to be in good spirits, actually. He said that there were many lies and distortions told about him during the trial, and he complained that he lost everything, including his home, possessions, and health and that he had used his time in jail to reflect, read his Bible, and get right with God. He said he can't change what happened, but all he can do is be sorry, which I don't believe for one fucking second that this guy was sorry, or that he got right with God, or whatever the hell. This is all an act. This guy is just trying to fool everybody. And with that, David Parker Ray was sentenced to 224 years in prison on September 30th, 2001. A 
week later, he did a media interview again and denied all the allegations. And just so you guys can hear what this monster sounds like and how not sorry he is, I want to play a short clip of this media interview. I get my excitement from making a woman happy. My trailer had numerous sex toys in it of different types, all different fetishes. I got pleasure out of the woman getting pleasure. Clearly, no remorse, no emotion. He seems almost like kind of happy in a way. It's just sick. Uh-huh. It's just sick to even listen to him speak. But his daughter, Jesse Ray, was found guilty of second degree kidnapping for the abduction of Marie Parker. And because of David's plea deal, she only served two and a half years in prison and then five years of probation. Cindy Hendy was actually released in 2019 after serving only half her sentence. She served her two years of parole in prison, and now she's just free. Just free in the world and doesn't have to report to anyone. How fucking crazy is that? She literally assisted this this monster with his torture chamber. Unbelievable. The fact that she didn't get life in prison is beyond me. It's crazy. Yeah. Three months after her sentencing, the law was changed to require criminals like her to serve 85% of their sentence, but it didn't apply retroactively to her case. Of course, Dennis Yancey was paroled in 2012 after serving 11 years, and three months after his release, he violated his parole and was sent back to prison to finish serving his original sentence. In November 2002, investigators opened the toy box to the public, hoping that it could help them identify more victims and survivors, but it didn't work because no one else came forward. Which, what the hell? What kind of what kind of shit is that? To open the toy box for anybody to just come in to hopefully... Ide- That's a bad tactic. Yeah. To burn that shit to the ground. Right. If you take pictures and video of it, like what else do you need that for? Who's going to walk in there? I guess they thought that maybe somebody would walk in there and be like, and just like remember being inside of the toy box, mm-hmm. which I guess could work in theory. But realistically, I think that's a horrible idea. Yeah, I agree. Just destroy that thing dump it into the the lake or something or you know just burn it to the yeah, ground burn honestly. that shit right investigators also continue to search the lake and the surrounding desert every few years with no luck and in 2011 there was a massive fbi search of mccray canyon near elephant butte lake looking for human remains and again they found nothing the fbi however has released hundreds of pictures of items from the trailer these trophies that they believe david had taken from his victims a lot of jewelry in there necklaces that women would have worn and they hope that someone will recognize something and either come forward as a victim or the family member or a friend of a missing woman. They also released photographs of two women they believe were his victims. One is a picture of an unidentified woman taken from a fake driver's license they found in the trailer. The other is a picture of Jill Troya. She was last seen on October 1st, 1995 at the Frontier Restaurant with Jesse Ray. And she's still missing. And since no additional victims have come forward, investigators believe David likely killed the rest. David had never agreed to officially confess to murder, but in May of 2002, he told investigators he was willing to talk. David was taken to the Lee County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, New Mexico to be interrogated by state police. He was waiting for the detectives in the holding cell, and they were hopeful that they would identify more victims and bring peace to more families, but they never got the chance. After over four decades of torturing, raping, and killing as many as 60 women, He was only behind bars for three years and only served eight months of his sentence before this bastard died of a heart attack on May 28, 2002. Wow. Unbelievable. And it's this kind of situation where it's like, yeah, the idea of like him rotting in prison and, and, but when you're that fucking old, like you're likely not going to live long enough to truly suffer, you know, the torture that you put your victims through in prison. And that's where I'm like, there's got to be. You know, an eye for an eye. Like sometimes yeah. I'm like that. That should be the 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 punishment for yeah. like. Doesn't that like if you're a victim in that case, wouldn't you want to see him be strapped into the chair and have all that shit done to him? Yeah, I think the eye for an so eye he can, would would be something that would help hold people accountable of their actions and understand more that hey, there's consequences for these actions. Yeah, and I mean, I get like I get the whole idea of like yeah, you want to take the higher road and forgive and forget and whatever and move on from it. But at the same time, I'm like. If that were me personally, in my personal opinion, I would want to, if he did that shit to me, I would do it back to him. Yeah, absolutely. So that he could under, truly understand, because I don't think he could fully ever understand or care 
or is even thinking about what he did otherwise. Yeah. He's just trying to survive. You know, he's like, oh, I'm reading my Bible and God and blah, right. blah, blah. I'm good now. Blah, blah. It's just a bunch of bullshit. Put him in the chair, do the shit that he did to others there and see how his, his tune changed. And that's my thing too, is like, maybe they would have been able to extract the information about other victims and found way more if they had put him in that type of situation i agree break him right break his mental give him those drugs at least get drug him up and hypnotize him and try to extract information from him exactly at the very least and i know there's torture techniques our own government to use yeah. overseas yeah, like, like guantanamo bay and shit yeah. like they're doing shit to you know potential terrorists and shit like that exactly like, why don't you take those same tactics and use it on people like this great it doesn't point. That, i've never understood that no. i just I've never understood and I get the whole death penalty argument and whatever, but it's like in this type of situation, like sometimes with people like that, there's only one way to, to break through them yeah. and that is to use their own shit back on them. Right. The most frustrating thing is that Ray didn't suffer himself no, whatsoever. Just a heart attack and died and then that's yeah, it. That it's over. It. So to this day, this whole thing is still an active investigation and the FBI has continued to follow up on new leads. The infamous introduction tape, however, was destroyed. And as of 2015, the toy box was actually still in the possession of the Albuquerque FBI. Cynthia V. Hill, the woman who escaped this violent psychopath and finally brought an end to his reign of terror, has obviously had a very difficult life as a result. But one positive is that she's become an outspoken advocate for other victims. In 2010, Cynthia co founded a volunteer run nonprofit called Street Safe New Mexico that provides support and resources for women who've struggled with drug addiction or homelessness or were victims of human trafficking, which is awesome. And their goal is to open a center that provides resources, medical care, and temporary housing to female sex trafficking survivors. And in 2011, Cynthia broke her silence in the media and finally started talking openly about what had happened to her. And she hopes that by hearing her story, others will be empowered to come forward, which I think is about the best thing you can do yeah. in this type of situation. So, I mean, major props to Cynthia for being strong enough to do that. Cause I don't even know. I don't even know. I'd probably be so bitter and angry and mm -hmm. angry that especially knowing that he just dies of the heart attack. I don't know. Absolutely. This story is just so fucked up and David Ray Parker or Parker yeah. Ray or whatever. Fuck this guy. Seriously. I, I have no words for this. If there is a hell, guy. I hope he's fucking burning and being tortured. Yeah. But I agree. Otherwise, I mean, I guess just fucking forget you know and just move on from this but at the same time like maybe hearing this you know one thing that could come out of hearing a story like this is that especially as a, a woman that you would be it would make you think okay i gotta be cautious i gotta be mm. you gotta be careful out there absolutely there's fucking crazy fucks like this guy oh, running yeah. around kidnapping people doing sadistic shit like yeah be careful out there absolutely be safe out there be aware i mean spatial awareness and just being aware of your surroundings these days is like the best thing you can do mm -hmm. just period with all the crazy shit that happens the boulder shooting and everything else that's going on like, oh yeah i am like every time i go out into a public space i'm always like looking around i'm always watching oh, yeah. things around me even in the parking lots i'm always like looking behind myself before i get in my cars because dude you never know never out know there. man and like if you're a woman you're especially at risk of something happening to you so it's mm -hmm. just like be careful be safe out there and that's where I'm going to end today's episode. <laughs> Don't know what else to say. Hopefully this was somewhat interesting to listen to. Hopefully it's not too, didn't disturb you too much. I don't understand why this is requested, but there it is. David Parker Ray, the toy box killer. But if you're not subscribed to the podcast and Apple podcast, make sure you do so. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and we'll be back next week with another very interesting episode about really a cult. So, until then, lights out, everybody.